Hey, my name's Luke McLean. Uh, yeah, I'm your host of Conscious Conversations. I'm a meditation teacher and a life coach. If you want to check some of me out and what I'm about, you can hit me at ecolifecoaching.net or lukemclean.net. It's going to take you to the same place. Um, on Instagram, it's lukemclean underscore or under slash mindfulness. So that's where I'm at. That's what I'm doing. I have actually just... Um, hit up a new website so i've got my podcast on there i've got some meditations and i'm hitting you with a little daily um blog that i'm just it's a little paragraph that i'm going to hit with each time and i'm coming up with this sort of new model that i'm playing around and you'll see it on the website and i'm really excited for it i'll talk more about that later but it's not about me this one's about kate james kate james is an author i think she's sold 110,000 copies of her book she's got four books out She's been in the mindfulness and mindful coaching space for you know over 20 years, so she's been bringing this a long time, and she's the real deal. She's well respected. She's well represented in in mindful coaching. You know, from books to speaking to retreats, to to working with big companies and and big bosses. She does the works. She's got a great diverse coaching range. Everything that Kate delivers is world class. Like you know, from a Instagram post to her website, just to how she uses her languages or it's an online course. She's, she's, she brings an authentic uh, professionalism to her, to this practice of coaching, which in coaching you can see a lot of people trying to get the fast fix really quickly. And in my time, you've got to find your voice and you've got to be patient in how you deliver it. You're better off trying to deliver something you know, that's really nice and you're really proud of than a lot of things done poorly and of you know, I've learned that lesson firsthand. So, you know, without further ado, welcome Kate James to Conscious Conversations. Yeah, oh... We're relocating a house at the moment. So we moved it from Ferntree Gully and we have moved it to Birigara. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know, it's been a process. They cut it into three pieces and they relocated it. And at the moment, we're just getting it put back together and, yeah, just doing all the fun stuff to the house. So it should be, I reckon, about four weeks away before we're looking like getting in. Wow, that's pretty exciting. It's super exciting, yeah. It's going to be nice. It's got a big shed out the back, which I'll, I'll be able to actually have a – an office to be able to do some coaching and and some stuff which I haven't had in the other houses sort of away from the kids. That's exciting because you've got lots of kids, haven't you? You've got five. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah, so it's hard to get a quiet space in the house and that's why we sort of put the shed will be like a rumpus room sort of play area for them. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, it'll be nice. Oh, good one. Well, I'm really glad. I'm, I'm glad things are good for yeah, you. Yeah, we're getting there. So I'm going to be excited to do this little chat because I think there's a lot for us to get through. Is there anything especially, Kate, that you wanted to touch on or, or talk about in it or just to... No, let's just see how we go, hey? Yeah. Yeah, I'll I think... Make... Oh, I just... Yeah, you know, I haven't got the other phone in here. That's good. I'm just making sure this phone's on... Um, it doesn't have vibrate on, so I'll just do that. I'll oh, put right. on Do Not Disturb. That's fine. Okay, all good. All right. So I think where I'd love to kick off, you know, and when you did the session at Cotton On, I'd love to kick off sort of and start with before you got into the coaching and the, and the meditation teaching and sort of how you transitioned, you know, from, you know, like a, a mum and a previous to the coaching and sort of how you made that leap into your own business, your own brand and, and what that looked like for you. Sure, is that a, sure. Is that okay to start with? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So I think we'll kick off there. I think it's just, Kate, you know, if you could just, you know, start with what life was like before meditation, before mindfulness, and before the coaching, and and what were you you were doing, you know, in that life, almost you know it would feel like another life ago. But you know, and when you were a mum raising the kids, you know, how did you sort of transition into the, into the coach? Yeah, sure. Okay, so it's sort of um, multi layered, really. Um, when I had my kids, oh, I'll just backtrack right to kind of the beginning of my um, interaction with meditation. So I actually first tried meditation when I was 21 um, I'd always been interested in sort of alternate things or from the time that I was about 14 and at 21 I read a book called The Calm Technique by Paul Wilson and I remember sitting at the end of the bed going okay I'll do exactly what he's described in the book and I closed my eyes and thought you know I'll try meditation according to these sort of rules 
or this outline that he'd given and and my experience was that nothing happened and you know it took me a long time to realize that that's pretty much the essence of meditation yeah and so I I gave it away at that point in time still had an interest but I didn't practice and then fast forward to when my eldest daughter was five and my younger daughter was two um we were and my husband, who works in the film industry, is a freelancer. We were going through a period in our lives where there was no work. And that had been, it was about six weeks of no work for him. And I was working part time, but, you know, it was a real challenge. And I'm, I was trying not to be stressed and noticing, though, that I was getting stressed with the kids. And I thought, look, I really have to revisit this meditation thing. So I learned transcendental meditation, which is you know it's quite a commitment financially and also time wise and I was very aware that it wasn't really ideal timing to be committing to anything financially but I really knew that it was the right thing and um, some of my family members helped me out a little bit with the finances which was lovely so I did that and from that day forward meditated every day and I, I still do I meditate yeah. every day and that's a long time ago now um, so 25 years ago what Kate, that story, which, you know, I, I, it always amazes me, but like what in your heart or, or what was it, what did it feel like that was telling you that you had to get back to meditation and that this was the right thing to do, even though in the head wise, financially, it might have seemed the wrong thing to do, but you just, what was that urge or that feeling that you had that, that told you that? Mm, I, I can only say that it was an instinct and I, I feel that if I'm, um, you know, really listening to myself and listening to my instincts. There are so many different examples that I have of being guided towards the right answers. And, you know, I can't sort of describe exactly what that looks like, but it's, I suppose, firstly, it means slowing down a bit because I tend to, you know, despite the fact that I teach mindfulness, I tend to be one of those people who's a bit go, go, go. Um, and so, you know, just slowing down enough to be able to see myself in that, moment it's a long time ago now so I can't really remember exactly what that was like yeah. but but I know that this plays out in my life even now um and and just going you know what do I need and so often I think the answers are within us and I knew that meditation was something that had called me for a long time and I'd just been ignoring that calling and you know I would say it's the single thing that has transformed my life more than any other thing yeah. Um, you know, so being a mum transformed me and being married to a beautiful partner is life-changing. But but really the thing that has had the biggest impact on me as an individual has been meditating. Yeah, well, it kind of acts as a boundary line a little bit for how you live. Like it just keeps everything, you know, not as it has to be, but it sort of just brings everything together in, in, a, in a way that you can show up, you know, authentically. Mm, yeah, I completely agree. The question, the question I just, you know, I get fascinated by really great questions, Kate, and I think, you know, um, you just asked a really important question, and I, I gather it's a question you would ask people that you coach a lot, but, you know, what do I need right now? Mm. Um, you know, the process of the, a question like that, you know, how do you go through, how did you go through that, and how do you go through that these days in terms of, of answering that, you know, with authenticity? Mm. Um, well, again, I think it comes back to slowing down, and I... You know, I notice that I get back into the habit of getting busy in my life and, um, you know, doing rather than being. Yeah. So I don't create that stillness. I do meditate every day, as I said, and I try to do a practice like a yoga practice, a physical practice that gets me into my body. Um, but still, I can get very caught up in the busyness of life. And, um, you know, coming back to that, just a little tiny bit of space and, and ground. I find grounding really important. So some people like to prefer to use the experience of earthing, so really sort of feeling your feet planted on the ground. And and then, again, it's intuitive that the experience of, you know, what do I need right now? It might not be anything huge. It might be, well, you just need to, you know, take an hour off or you need to go for a walk or you need to eat a bit healthier or whatever it is or you need to change relationships or and then it can be bigger things like you need to change your life in some way um, but I think the beginning point is probably just slowing down enough to feel as though you get into your body into the physical experience of being in your body and for me 
it helps to be grounded. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's beautifully put. I think personally, I know that when you, you can slow down, you can actually cultivate some space from that, from the slowness and then the space to receive what needs to be received um, mm. becomes important in, in that part of the practice. Definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so you, you, you did the TM course and you, and, and you, <laughs> You, you talk about the importance of the financial commitment because that was a little bit of the catalyst in terms of taking it a bit more seriously. Is, is that true? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, with TM, they teach in a much more rigid way than I teach, um, which for me was actually really good because they said in that course that you make a commitment to meditate twice a day every day for 20 minutes. Yeah. And, and – you know, I, I, I guess because I'd made the big financial commitment and also because we were in a challenging place, I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. And and so I did meditate twice a day, every single day for three years without missing a single day, which was hard with two little kids. You know, you can imagine a two-year-old and a five-year-old sometimes weren't that keen on the idea of me I, being in the room. I can with, ima- imagine that really well. Yeah, yep. sometimes they'd be having a little tiff outside the door. You know, I'd try and meditate when play school was on. Or I'd <laughs> meditate before they got up in the mornings, but it didn't always work out like that. Um, but it was transformative. And I think it was literally about three weeks after I started that I just felt this complete shift in my energy. It was like it was like someone turned the volume down. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you know, it was just the most beautiful thing. And then after three years, I think I got a bit, you know, maybe a bit arrogant with it. And I thought, oh, I think I'm pretty cured now. You know, I'm good. I don't I don't have to meditate every day, twice a day. And so I dropped it for a little while, not for very long. But it was just about a week later that I remember, I remember this really clearly driving down the road near my house and someone cut me off in traffic. And I felt this irritation and I thought, you know, I hadn't had that feeling. I things that would potentially irritate you in life when you're meditating consistently I think that you know that's what I mean about the volume being turned down you you just don't feel that rise of frustration or irritation um, that is synonymous with so many of us yeah it takes a lot more to get you to that point doesn't it once you yeah it really does when you're in shape it's it's a lot I you know with being in the with a wellness background Kate it's similar to working out and getting fit it's like you get fit and you don't realize how fit you are whether it's you know surfing or running until you stop it for a few weeks and then have to get back and start again that you realize hang on I was in actually in really good shape and how quickly I could lose shape after three or four weeks of not doing anything and and absolutely agree that meditation is the same exactly the same sort of principle behind it Mm, I think that's a really good analogy, actually. And you lose it quickly, but you can get it back quickly. Yeah. So, you know, that's comforting to know. And I, luckily for me, I did. I went straight back to it, and I and I got it back quickly, which was, you know, great. But it was quite, probably in a way, quite helpful to see or to become aware of that distinct difference of, you know, with meditation and without meditation. Yeah, okay. And in this, you're going through this journey, you know, with the young kids, and I know that your kids are grown up now. So, mm. so sort of, what's the landscape of meditation and mindfulness back then? Like, because I imagine it, it's nowhere near what it is now. And, and you were one of the first, you know, sort of coaches or life coaches to really put the spotlight, especially in, in Australia, on, on meditation and mindfulness as a coaching platform. So, what was the meditation and mindfulness landscape like at that stage? You, you're right, it was really different. So I didn't start my business until the kids were a bit older. Um, I started the business in 2002. So that was, um, I think, about nine years after I first started meditating. Yeah. And even then, so, tw- you know, 25 years ago when I first started meditating, it was really quite a um, – it wasn't a mainstream thing. That's probably the best way to describe it. So there were a few spiritual groups, but that was about it. TM was probably one of the more mainstream versions that you, of meditation that you could learn. Um, and then, so then I'd been working um, as a business manager for creative people. I've always hung out with creative people and, you know, I never really considered myself to be creative. So I like to just hang around creative people to make me feel like I was at least <laughs> of that. Yeah, cool. Um, 
I've learned since then that actually everyone's creative. 